Hey everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is fellow breaking news reporter, Derek Saul. Derek, appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate you having me, Brittany. I was really fascinated by a recent piece you wrote for Forbes about a former Russian billionaire's mysterious death and the fight surrounding his assets. What can you tell us? Yeah, so wrote this story uh, with my uh, with my colleague John Ponciano, who uh, couldn't be with here be with us here today. Um, but we looked into last week. There was a complaint filed in Florida court outlining a really messy battle pitting generation against generation. So Dmitry Zelenov, he was about 50 years old. He died in France in December. Um, and he was not an American citizen, but his parents and his widow and children are. And so there's, a, he did not leave a will. He died unexpectedly. Um, you know, his, the attorneys representing his widow and his children told us it was under um, what they believed were mysterious circumstances. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into, but there's been a host of powerful Russian people that have died under, you know, circumstances that I'm, I'm no, uh, not to put on my my CSI cap, um, but, you know, that under people that are young and dying in, you know, ways that you may not expect. And so he has tens of millions of known assets that were outlined in the complaint that different groups um, lay claims to. So he had no will. And then there's also typically if there's a trust and different agreements, it's those can be used as pretty good proxies, but none of that existed. So his two, his two children, one of whom is a minor, one of whom is an adult named in the complaint and his widow are suing his grandparents and a network of financial advisors and LLCs, complicated corporate structures, trying to get back certain certain assets um, that they believe they are entitled to. Before we get into this really ugly battle for his assets, how did Zelenov make his fortune? So real estate. Um, so we named him a billionaire in 2008, I believe, at 36. So he was one of Europe's youngest billionaires at the time. And he fell off the billionaire ranks um, along with while real estate prices uh, collapsed across the globe. Um, and so he was worth, I mean, I, you know, this, <laughs> I, I do not do billion valuations but um based on what you can find now and what was alleged in the complaint um he, he definitely had a couple hundred million dollars in, in assets um most notably his company don Stroy, which was eventually um, overtaken by a state-controlled bank they built what at the time was the largest residential apartment building in russia um which was i believe it was triumph palace in moscow 61 stories um, so yeah, it was a real estate mogul, um, and as is common with many, with many ultra wealthy people, but especially um, Russian billionaires, but kind of a, a vast array of holdings and organized in a you know in a multinational way that's definitely um, you know is confusing. But then also, I mean, you look at this and the the estate battles of and and when anyone dies unexpectedly, it can it can get messy. But especially if it's held through all these, you know, these complicated structures, these trusts and LLCs. And he was actually domiciled, so based for tax reasons in Cyprus, which is uh, more of a tax haven, and also had residences in France. One of the debated assets is rental proceeds from a ski, from a uh, luxury ski lodge in France. So very messy, very, very international. Like you said, very international. He's got assets in Russia, in France, in the U.S. Does this complicate things further because he's got assets all over the globe? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, 
I just talked to um, a lawyer who has experience in international estate planning. And so obviously there's complications of just with countries being, you know, different countries having different laws, but then there's also just in, in basic law codes. Um, so the U.S. has... Um, the U.S. has common law, as do most former British colonies in the U.K. itself, and then France and Russia both have civil law. So that's just a, you know, that that's more of a technicality. So it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's with the U.S. Um, judicial opinions are based on prior prior opinions and precedents, and uh, in Russia and France, you know, it it does not it goes off of. Um, you know, just the prevailing what is what is what is codified in the law. Um, so, in this specific complaint, it is mostly U.S. based assets, but there's other things that you know there, there's other things that are claimed. There's six or seven cars that are in Moscow, and um, you know, in the complaint, they say that they were just surprisingly locked out of a family apartment in in Moscow, um, and the real true asset in question at this point is a $5 million house in Alpine, New Jersey, um, that the parents are currently living in, but they, the, his widow and children allege they are entitled to. At the time of his mysterious death back in December, he didn't have any estate plan, any trust, any will to divvy up his assets. I mean, this was a really rich man. He was on the Forbes billionaires list at one point in his life. So is this normal for someone of his fortune, of his wealth, to not have a plan once he passes away? You know, it seems um, with without, you know, com <laughs> without getting too much into speculation, you know, it definitely seems odd um, that someone with so many assets does not have does not have proper estate planning. And I think you're also, when you're getting more into the nitty gritty, I think it makes sense of, oh, if someone with his, you know, with cars and stuff like that, not having specific, a specific will for that. I don't think, I don't think it's that he had no estate, estate planning whatsoever. I think it's, you know, if you're, if things happen unexpectedly, you're not, you're not thinking of, every asset and if it's someone that holds hundreds of millions of dollars in assets and the attorneys representing his his widow um and children mentioned to and i sh i should mention there's the two children mentioned the lawsuit um on the one side and then there's uh two children that are named on the other side of the lawsuit um so i'm i am referring to one adult male son and one minor son when i say the widow the widow and children um and i will also clarify at this point that we only know about the one side of the complaint a summons has been issued but we have not heard more on it uh from from the opposing side we were unable to get comment from from the other side um but his attorneys mentioned to me that there were four pages meant four pages of Russian real estate holdings, all all of this in France, assets in the US as well. So it makes sense that some things may not have been entirely planned out, maybe the way that you or me would think about divvying up our, you know, it, it's like when it's a billionaire, uh, you know, a Rolls Royce is like thinking of, uh, you know, it's, I don't think I've, I don't think I've, I've, I've formerly uh, said for formally said who would, who would have uh, my Ford if someone, if someone, if something were to happen to me. So, you know, I, I guess it's, it's like that on a percentage basis, but yeah, it, it is very strange because, you think of these people that have accumulated all this wealth of being so meticulous with it. And obviously, since there aren't any concrete plans to divvy up his assets, the claws have really come out here. So how is this playing out? So right now, we will believe it's, it's roughly around Valentine's Day that the people named in the complaint have to respond to a court summons. 
then it would set up a very long and lengthy legal process. Um, so as with, with anything that's related to a lawsuit, typically what would happen is it ends in some sort of settlement or, you know, something out of court, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it, you know, it could be, it could be over, over multiple years and, you know, see, see family members testify against each other in court. Um, so et cetera, et cetera. But, um, in, in the short term would have to see if there's what the response is, if there's any sort of countersuit, um, you know, if any other details emerge. How are the parents able to stay in the one home? Is this like a squatter's rights situation? So his parents, obviously, I mentioned before, are U.S. citizens. And so th there's no there's no issues related to that. And in terms of the organization of things, so there were five or six different LLCs and corporations that were named in the suit. And so I believe it was one of the LLCs that was the official that was the official owner of the house. And so I wouldn't quite go so far as squatters rights in terms of what what we may be may be thinking about. But yes, essentially, if it's if it's status quo where, oh, I was living in this house under my, you know, under the previous conditions and then someone died, that doesn't mean that I should have to, you know, move out and the house is now in in your name. I would I would imagine that's what the defense would would look like. Derek, uh, as you Derek, as you alluded to, he's not the first wealthy Russian to die under mysterious circumstances recently. In fact, you reported Zelenov is one of at least 12 extremely wealthy Russians who have suddenly died mysteriously since Russia invaded Ukraine. Coincidence or is there something more sinister here? Yeah, so I will say with Zelenov specifically, we were unable to find anything that was specifically relating to his criticism of Putin or the war. He also, he wasn't, he was not a billionaire at the time of his death. He was obviously ultra wealthy, ultra powerful, but he wasn't someone that had some sort of massive platform. So I think there were a few other examples that you could connect the dots to a little bit more. The former Luke Oil chairman and Luke Oil, the huge Russian um, energy company and they explicitly spoke out against the war in ukraine and there was also i believe his name is pavel antov um and he he died after explicitly criticizing the war so you know i mean <laughs> i think it's it's definitely a lot of people dying in especially mysterious circumstances i know zelenov um you know, it was falling, it was, he was a, a young guy and falling down a flight of stairs. There was at least one example of someone falling out a window. There was one really weird one where it was a formal or oil company executive and he died in the basement of a voodoo house in Moscow. So yeah, I would, <laughs> I, I would say, uh, you know, that it's just hard to attribute things to a coincidence yeah, Derek, it's uh, unusual and mysterious, definitely to say the least. And thank you so much for joining us to break it down. Thank you. Really appreciate it.